world has changed. America has changed. If something were to happen tomorrow... How self-sufficient would you be? Could you grow your own food? Could you sustain your own livestock? Could you survive? This is the We Grow Our Show with Nick and Don. Nick and Don talk about everything from politics to planting. They cover techniques, methods, and tips on how to not only survive, but thrive. Visit the website at WeGrowHours.com. Lock and load. This is the We Grow Our Show. Get your grow on. Welcome back to the We Grow Our Show. Oh, man. Episode 8. Episode 8. Yep. 8 is great. <laughs> so on Sunday, for those of you that didn't catch it, we had our first live show. It actually wasn't ours. We were on with uh, Lena. Yeah, the Prepper's Path. The Prepper's Path. Yes. Not to be confused with the Prepper Patch with Tony Tangelos. That's right. This is on PrepperBroadcasting.com. And yes, sir. She was nice enough to have us on, introduce ourselves, talk about us a little bit, let us talk about us a little bit. Nick did most of the talking. I didn't know such thing. You talked a lot about aquaponics too, you freaking Mike Hogg. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I will tell you that the live chat is very cool. They have on Prepper Broadcasting on all of their live shows, in fact, on our show as well, which is Mondays, um, they have – Live chat, which is cool. So I promised a couple of people I would do a shout out. So I'm going to get that out of the way right now because I promised Freaky and Jimmy D. Distillus. Uh, Distillus. Sounds like he's making it. He said he'd come on. He said he'd come on and teach us distilling. Oh, that um, makes which sense. I think is a phenomenal prepper idea, a phenomenal self sustainability thing because you can make it out of fu- use it for fuel, yep. use it for antiseptic, use yeah. it for bartering, and of course, if things are really bad, you just get drunk and let it go. Yes. <laughs> I guess oh that's, that's one way of doing it, right? Get lit and meet Jesus. All right. <laughs> gosh. Uh, poor farm girl, um, comp croaky. And I know this guy, we're going to have him on the show too, Radio Prep NC. He's in, guess where? Uh, North Carolina. You got it. Oh and my gosh. He is going to have a show on Prepper Broadcasting as well very soon from what I understand. So, uh, a shout out to all of you. Uh, Jimmy, I'm sorry if I messed up that name there. Uh, Distills, I assume. Jimmy Distillus. D. Distills. Yeah. Sounds like it's one of those Roman Maximus Gluteus. D E E D T I L E S S. Yeah, I don't know how to spell it. All right. Anyway, so <laughs> to, we've got some really good guests on the show this week. This week? This week. Yeah. Oh, Nick I thought there and were Don. a couple of morons. Yeah, Nick and Don. That's our guests. We are n- no guests this week. We're going to have a serious talk about self-sustainability, about prepping, about some things that everybody should know, and some maybe some real-world experience that Nick has, um, that I have, kind of what he does and what he plans to do if if he loses his job, if he if the grid goes down, if the economy collapses, how are you guys going to live life? Maybe some things you haven't thought about before. Uh, I, uh, we posted a great article, and it's going to be on our uh, blog at wegrowours.com. Look at the show notes and blog. You'll see this really good article on there. About a lady who just went through the ice uh, ice storm back east, and they were without power for five days. Ooh. Did you read this, Nick? I don't know how to read. All right. So this is some of the things, and, and I'll discuss this with you since you haven't read it, and see if you can guess. What do you think some of their challenges were? Well, uh, if there's no electricity, that means water can't be pumped. Right. And so your water lines wouldn't get to you. If you're in an ice storm and you have an electric heat, uh, you don't have heat anymore. Right. And even in some gas – powered heaters, you need electricity to regulate it. Yeah. So there's right there just the comfort issue and the safety in the, the – So these folks elemental. are preppers. Oh, they are. They okay. are preppers. They, they've been prepping for a long time. They're fairly experienced preppers. But I think one of the interesting things that came out to me was you were right. They, they ended up having water because I think it was their son is also a prepper and they had water from him because their well was down. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they were able to get water. That wasn't too big of an issue. 
But it was some of the Plus little it was snowing, so you can always just go out and harvest it. Yeah, and heat it up. Um, mm-hmm. They don't have a wood burning stove. They said that's definitely on the priority list. They yeah, had get heaters, them while you can. And they were worried about carbon monoxide during that mm-hmm. time. They were worried about things like that. One of the really interesting things to me was the light. They said they didn't have much light, and you know, winter time back east, it gets dark early and things like that. Oh, yeah, and they couldn't. She couldn't read. They have, you know, they, they have a whole bunch of books and games and things, but it would get dark and they couldn't do anything. So what do you do without light? I'd never given that a, a whole lot of thought. You know, okay, we've got flashlights and LEDs and all. What are you going to hold it like a book light and, and read and play games over a flashlight? You really need to make sure you've got your lanterns, mm-hmm. things like that. And you don't want to use that up when you don't know how long you're going to go. So maybe yeah. solar in that situation to, to well, and charge I, some LEDs. True, but you know, in a winter storm, there's not a whole lot of sunshine either. Right, you'd be better off with a windmill. And things, uh, there you go, a windmill. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that, that I just found that to be fascinating. That some of the things she was talking about getting glow in the dark knitting needles because yeah. she wanted to knit, but she couldn't. Um, glow in the dark knitting needles. Yeah, that's not on my priority list. But I commend her for Gives wanting you to be productive to in the dark. I know how to knit. <laughs> It's a prepper skill. So I mean, agreed. I know how to kill rabbits. My wife will learn how to knit. Yeah. (laughs) On top, my wife does too. On, I taught her. On top of the, uh, the list, I think is starvation. You got to worry about your food. Of course. Yeah. So canned food to start with, especially in a winter storm, Mm -hmm. you've got that. But then we're going to talk about self sustaining and livestock um, in Arizona here. We have to deal with the heat. Back east, you have to deal with the ice. How do you deal with that? What are the ranges you can have for the rabbits, things like that? How might you keep them warm or cool without grid power? Mm -hmm. Dehydration is Mm. probably number two on my list, if not number one, being in Arizona in the summertime. Dehydration is way up there. Average family uses 400 gallons a a day. You know, you've got to get that down. How do you get that down and how do you live comfortably without – smelling. Yeah. I mean, sanitary, things like that. Cooking, you've got to do all that. Can you reuse the water in cooking that you use to wash, things like that? You know, because you're boiling it. Yeah. yeah. You're still having particulates that are left over and it's going to add some funky flavors to your, uh, well, and if you, to that's your soup. Something like a big filter might might work. You know? Yeah, exactly. So I think things like that, um, we've got to worry about the elements now, do you, indoor, outdoor. Here's, here's a a question that's on topic, but yet very, very far on the edge. Do you personally, do you drink your aquaponic water? I have just to show people that you can. Okay. Um, How's I, the taste? It tastes like water. Okay. So it, it's not. It, it actually, I mean, it tastes like, um, it's not fishy or anything or uh-huh. weird or stagnant or nasty or anything. It does have a, a dirty taste. Like there's minerals in it. Yeah. Like almost like dirt. Yeah. I don't know how else to explain it. I, well, back in Wisconsin, uh, my dad has a, a creek that runs right through his farm. Yeah. And I'd be out all day long and you get thirsty and they always say, don't drink the water, don't drink the water because of this, that or the other. Uh, they're afraid of microbials and all this yeah, stuff. Yeah. Well, you don't know what's upstream pooping in it. True. Very true. Well, I'd always drink the water because I didn't want to walk the mile and a half back to the house. And I tell you, that's some of the best water I've ever tasted. It had a little bit of a dirt taste to it, but uh, I'd say it still tastes better than Arrowhead. <laughs> oh, yeah. So yeah. Uh, No, I'm, I'm right there with you. I, we had a brook behind my grandparents' house. We'd go play and you'd drink it all the time. I think with that, you're more concerned, is there a dead animal up creek? Yeah. Or is literally well, if the something... water smells bad, you're going to know. Yeah, and it's not stagnant. I mean, yeah. you know where this thing is. Of course, we had chemical plants all over the place too, so that probably didn't is help. Is that why you have three eyes? It might, three eyes, yeah. It might be... <laughs> <laughs> so if what what we've talked about this before. So what are you preparing for personally? Well, uh first and foremost, economic collapse, whether it be personal or widespread. Uh everybody gets in a tight spot occasionally with money. Okay. And if the spot is tight enough for long enough, you're screwed. Yeah. You know, so uh my wife and I have figured out how much money it would take us to live. If neither of us had jobs and how much it would cost to um, stay in my house comfortably and I know that figure. And so – So what I, happens if if there is an actual economic collapse 
let's say, or even a, a grid down situation, you can't even access your cash. So uh, I can, but yeah. All right. Well, you can. Well, Most people can't. Um, because their money is in the bank. I mean, we mm-hmm. keep, we try to keep silver and things for that. Do you, do you keep anything like that? No. Um, my, uh, when I say I can access it, I don't use, you know, most of my assets are physical items. You know, I don't keep, um, I don't keep gold or silver or anything like that, but I have assets that I can liquidate if needed. In a situation where, yeah, they would be, they would be usable in a grid down situation. They would be desirable in an economic collapse. Right. And not that I want to be all secretive, but you know, there's, I don't really don't You're want any of you idiots to come around my house looking for this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we, you know, <laughs> we try to keep a roll of silver around, um, right next to the AK 47 for anybody that's listening. Yeah, you know, exactly. The, uh, the Bushmaster. Uh, so that's the type of thing that I want to talk about today. Okay. And I want to talk about live food storage because that's what we're mm-hmm. pushing. I want to talk about teaching the community. I've had a lot of people say, Hey, you know, I love this idea, but can I do it? How much time does it take? What am I getting into? And mm-hmm. I know let's cover time. How many, what are you doing right now at your house? Personally growing, prepping, farming, that type of thing. Well, we'll just cover what's legal. Uh, no, just kidding. <laughs> I don't, I don't grow anything illegally. Actually, judging by my CCNRs or the HOA, yeah, I am growing stuff illegally. I'm not abiding by those rules and I am okay with that. Hopefully you guys are too. But I have a few ducks in the backyard that are laying about an egg. They average like, I think their average is, uh, an egg every day. Seven days or like five days a week, roughly. I can't get my – my ducks won't do that. Really? I get an egg a day for about a week and a half to two weeks uh-huh. and then I get nothing for two weeks. OK. And then I get an egg a day for two weeks and then nothing. Now, I don't have a male duck and we're we're dealing with oh, yeah, Muscovies. Okay. Yeah, the minor Muscovies okay. too. And these guys – If you get another male or they hatch a male – or you have fertilized I have eggs. A, I have a male you can have. Yeah. I would love a male Muscovy. Okay. Oh, look at that. We did a trade right on the show. That, folks, is how it works. That's why Holla you need to get people Lugia. in. That's why you need to get people in your community. Exactly. And that's, I, I have, uh, my ratio is, is two females for every male Muscovy. And, uh, it's like a Beach Boys song back there all the time. Yeah. Two girls for every, anyway. Um, well, I have the two girls. One of them today hatched a black chicken. Um, I guess Why does was, it have to be about race with you? <laughs> I guess she was sitting on <laughs> this kidding. egg. It's a cute, I'll put a picture up. It's a cute little chicken, but we have, we don't have any black chickens of laying age. So I have no idea where this chicken came from. I don't know how it was. I mean, our rooster had, our rooster passed away a couple weeks ago. So it had to be by him. The new rooster is too young yet to do anything. Uh, we have no male. Wow ducks and this is a, obviously a chicken and the chickens that we had that were that color are not laying yet so i don't know where this black chicken came from but we're gonna find out i guess as it gets bigger so we've got a new black chicken in the house and we sold a bunch of them anyway go ahead that's pretty cool yeah um but yeah i've got the ducks uh i've got the muscovies going i also have an aquaponic system that's under construction at the moment. I it's like a 600 gallon tank. We have to system. work on that together. Yeah, well, it's just all I have is a biofilter running. I don't even have any grow beds or anything. It's just it's just for fish at the moment. Right. And I was able to maintain pretty good nitrogen off of it because it was over filtration by far. Um, we'll talk about that. Uh, that's that's set up and ready to ready to be added on to. But my staple obviously is rabbits. I have a 15 by 8 foot shed and in that shed I have 30 rabbits. Now that is much more than my wife and I need. Absolutely, a lot more. And by about 28. Yeah, by about 28. But those 30 those 30 breeding female rabbits and their five boyfriends um will produce 150 to 175 babies a month on average and with those I can barter um, do you barter now with those? Of course. Yeah. In fact, I, I'm knocking on wood here that, uh, I don't screw this deal up just by mentioning it, but I have a, a, a friend of a friend that builds bumpers and I just bought a Nissan Titan and the nice. bumper is 
uh, well, it looks kind of girly and it's just not, it's made out of plastic and I don't want to be the one taking damage in an accident. I want to be dealing it. So I'm having this bumper built and it would retail for 16 to 1600 to $2,000. Well, it just so happens this friend of a friend is a rabbit, um, connoisseur. He's a rabbiteer as, uh, Boyd Craven calls us and, uh, he's willing to trade. So I am going to sell him i'm going to trade him some of my cages and some of my rabbits and get him set up pretty and i'm going to pretty much straight straight up trade with him for the total cost of the bumper that's awesome and so yeah in a grid down situation let's say you've got somebody that's uh lds and has a year's worth of wheat and didn't think to have any dry packed meat and you're raising rabbits or quail and fish with those, you just go over to your friendly Mormon neighbor and say, hey, how about a little bit of protein for a little bit of your carbohydrates? And just trade up. And yeah. Now, are you, you're going to get the aquaponic system going, oh, yeah. but l- right now you're not using that. So no. mostly, are you doing any gardening? I have moringa planted. Okay. That doesn't count. It doesn't. Well, not. It's 40% protein, yeah, no, I mean, dude. It counts. It counts. As a plant. All right. But how, all right. Let me get to the real question. <laughs> how much time do you spend on those 30 rabbits? What does it cost you in time? Oh, 30 rabbits, 15 minutes a day. 15 maybe. minutes a day. And that's because I'm out there lollygagging and petting a few of them. If I had to haul ass and get everybody fed, I could do it in less than five minutes. And now, just, is that once a day, twice a day? Once a day. Once a day. So you feed yours once? Yep. And then do you check on them or anything? Well, I, I mean, I don't neglect them, but I'm I'm out there once a day in the morning, and then at night I'll go out there too. Yeah. So I feed them in the morning, and I go out there at night and uh, shut their lights off around ten. So um, I need to get a timer. It's been it's been nice going out there and checking on everybody, but I do need to get a timer to shut the lights off. So fifteen minutes a day, thirty rabbits. Yep. And what else do you spend your time at home prepping, doing things? Do you do canning? Do you guys spend any time canning, doing anything like that? Not yet. I mean, we've got everything to can and I know how to do it. We have a pressure cooker. We have large pots. We've got all of these things that we could can. But I, I understand that speaking of, you mentioned the, uh, Mormon LDS. Uh-huh. I understand that they have open canning parties. Oh yeah. And you know, that's we are a canning really good, nerds. that's a really good resource around to, and, and, and uh-huh. these are open parties apparently where oh, people yeah, can come learn and work. And don't be afraid of them. They're not going to like try and convert you. And for those hardcore Christians that are anti-Mormon, we're not going to try and steal your soul from your point of view. <laughs> um, but, you know, just if you've got a friend that's LDS, ask them about canning. And chances are one in three are canning nuts. And in fact, my, I mean, when I'm, they're crazy about canning. I shouldn't say canning nuts because it sounds like they're actually putting <laughs> nuts in a can, uh, which you can do. But anyway, the, like my mom was a, was a canning specialist, uh, for the stake, which is a group of wards, which is a group of people, which okay. is organization. Anyway, um, but yeah, talk to, talk to somebody in the LDS church and they'll hook you up. There's a cannery in Mesa where you just go down there and volunteer and then pay for the cost of stuff and you end up with cans of of uh uh instant mashed potatoes, beans, wheat, rice. So oh, as far as a budget prep. Oh yeah. That it's, could be a phenomenal resource is yeah. to find something like that. Facebook is a phenomenal resource. Mm-hmm. I know a lot of people don't believe in Facebook, but those yeah. that don't you don't have to put personal information on this thing. No, I, go I out wouldn't. there and look for the groups. Look for you know, mm-hmm. Arizona Farm Swap, Phoenix, you know, Backyard Farmers, all of these different groups for us that that we're we're a member of, and we actually have even started one. I know they're out there for other communities. Oh, so yeah. go look around. There's there's some groups called Swip Swap. We we th- throw a lot of our aquaponics vegetables on the Swip Swap. Swip Swap. Yeah, you mainly sell used things. It's kind of like Craigslist, but uh-huh. for your local community, garage sale, door to door. Is that through Facebook? Facebook. It's Facebook this little has Facebook swip thing. Swip? Yeah, it's pretty cool. My wife does it all the time. You know, she might sell a little purse, but we'll put up bags of parsley because I have Sweet. so much parsley growing and sell it for two or three bucks and, or trade it for something else. So there's a lot of barter stuff out there on Facebook. Mm-hmm. Craigslist is another example for those budget prepping. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, that's that's what I want to talk about is time and what what you do and how you do it. I know with me, I've got the aquaponics. Mm-hmm. 
Um, we've got about 50 fish right now in there. We're growing quite a bit of our fruits and vegetables. We've got strawberries growing. We've got parsley. I've got mint, amazing mint. amounts of mint, chocolate mint, spearmint, uh, apple mint, I think pineapple mint, some different weird mints, hot peppers, regular peppers, cantaloupes, all sorts of things in there. The sugar snap peas, my wife gets all mad because I go out and I eat them all before we can bring them in the house because <laughs> they're just so good. So – my greenhouse, I, my morning consists of walking out and feeding the fish. I take a look once a week at the water. That takes me an extra five minutes, you know, test the pH, test the ammonia levels, make sure everything's good. I, I pretty much know now by you, – you were mentioning the taste. I can actually smell if it's off a little bit oh. and I'll be able to tell. I then feed my quail, gather their eggs if there are any in the mornings and go out. I feed my rabbits, walk around the back, feed our chickens – we're down to 20 ish right now because we've got, we got rid of a bunch this weekend and I'll talk about the bartering with that in a minute. Got rid of those, uh, feed the goats, walk back in the house 15 minutes. That's it. Now, once a week we go out and we try to do it once a week, go out and harvest everything mm-hmm. out of the aquaponics system. That maybe takes 10, 15 minutes. And then once a month I'll go out and do a real good cleaning. Because I, I, right now I have quail in the greenhouse and we clean all the pens out and things like that. That probably takes us – the kids get out there and help us. That's probably a good two hours. Um, sometimes we stretch it to four because we're having fun doing it and you know oh, we yeah, have the whole family out. But Don't think of that as time costed. I mean that's right. not costing you time. You're with your kids and you're teaching them how to work. Yeah. And I'll tell you, not to sound like an old man, but – Kids these days don't know how to work. And not I'll, I'll admit my generation does not know how to work. That's, uh, you know, the, let's say 20 to 30 year olds right now. They're like the first products of the video age. Like, I don't know because I grew up on video games too and I'm a bit older than you. Yeah, but. I was outside playing most of the time. That's the thing so. is that you had a transition. Your parents were probably more like, get off of that death box thing. You just got out there and play. Yeah. Yeah. TV didn't raise us. We raised ourselves outside. Yeah. So no, I, I totally agree. But you look at the, you know, time, even if you don't have kids, if you don't, you know, want to do it, mm-hmm. the time that I spend in it with all of the animals we have, we have two dairy goats, four goats total, 20 something chickens. I, I don't know how many quail right now. I think I've got 30, 60, 80 quail thereabouts, only a couple of breeders and in, in different stages of getting ready for the meal uh, and collecting eggs and all that. It's 15 minutes a day. Hmm. It really is not bad if you if you roll that up. I mean, cost wise, too, it's not much. So are you what are you feeding your rabbits? Are you feeding them pellets right now? Actually, no. I have I have pellets available for them, but they usually leave the pellets alone. I actually started feeding fodder. You are feeding fodder at this yeah. point. I'd say 90% of what they eat is fodder. The other 10% is clippings off of a tree that's going crazy in my backyard. So how much time do you spend feeding them, growing the fodder? What's oh, that like? Okay. So in the evening, I will turn on an episode of Swamp People and – uh, rinse a, rinse a can of, of barley seed. And that takes like two seconds to just rinse it and let it sit. And then you change the water out and let it sit. And then you change the water out and you leave it sit overnight. And then the next morning, uh, you feed a tray of fodder that's grown for the last six days. And then you've got an empty tray that you just rinse off real quick and you put the, the freshly soaked barley in that tray and then you put it back into the fodder system. And if you go to hostelhair.com underneath of the tools of the trade tab or equipment, I can't remember if it's equipment or tools of the trade. You're upgrading your website soon, aren't you? Yes. We're in the process. Um, But in there you can see the fodder kits and the one that I'm using is the six tray. Uh, The six tray will grow 15 pounds of barley fodder a day. And it's a six day process, but you've always got the process going from day one to day six. They overlap. So you constantly have new barley seed going in and barley mats coming out. Well, 15 pounds of barley fodder feeds all of my rabbits and then some. 
So this is a six tray fodder kit you're uh-huh. using. It looks like on your website it is two hundred and seventy dollars. Yes. That's pretty good. Now, what are you saving in food versus pellets? Well, it went from seventy-eight cents a pound of rat per rat pound of rabbit meat down below right around twelve to fifteen cents a pound uh, to grow rabbit meat, and that's live that's what, weight. Sixty cents a yeah, 60, a pound. Sixty cents a pound. So, uh, my daily price is about two to three cents per serving. Whereas when I was feeding pellets, it was, uh, 0.78. It was like 7.8 cents so, to 8, 8.2 cents. So you have basically one 50 pound bag of barley. Mm-hmm. Turns into 300 pounds of feed. 50 pounds? 50 pounds times six because for every pound that you put in, you get six pounds out. Okay. Um, if you. So basically you've paid for the fodder system in one bag of barley, pretty really much. close. Yeah. I mean, that's what four hundred. So yeah. three hundred divided by fifty is six. So six times fifteen, a which bag is and a half. Yeah, six times six times fifteen is what is that? You, um, you lost me. So let's not 30. do math on the air. Come on. Anyway, come on. Uh, it doesn't cost near as much as buying formulated pellets. Now, some will argue that pellets are formulated for rabbits specifically, so you have to. Uh, account for the minerals and the, and the vitamins that they're not getting. But barley hits it just about on the money. If you have willow, uh, like willow trees around and you could give them all the willow that they can chew on, they'll get a lot of their, um, fiber from the willow as well as a lot of vitamins and, and minerals and stuff and keep them, keep them regular and then give them the, the barley grass as well. I've been using moringa stalks and uh, this tree. I'm not really sure what it is. I should probably look into that. But. You know, what about – you're the rabbit guy. I probably should ask you this. I feed mine broccoli a lot. Um, is that good for them? I'm going to have to double check. I think it's pretty high in calcium. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, calcium, too much calcium. By a cause... lot. I feed them a leaf uh, every few days. Okay. I, I don't think you're going to have an issue there. You can feed them a carrot every few days and be fine too. Okay. Uh, carrots are like a Snickers bar to, to rabbits. If they're eating nothing but carrots, you're going to have issues. If they're eating nothing but broccoli, you're going to have urinary tract failures. Uh, even lots and lots of alfalfa, straight alfalfa, if it's not cut with some sort of uh, Bermuda or a Timothy or some other high fiber grass, you're going to get some, uh, uh, some plugged up bunnies. Yeah, we're, we're still on pellets at this uh-huh. point. We want to move into the fodder system. That's our yeah. next project. I know where you can get some. Um, yeah, I have to. I, I actually have a fifty-pound bag of barley, and we've done a, few, a little bit of it in the oh. house, just in some trays, and you know, just next to the sink, squirt it. But so we're doing it once a week, and we're sending it out uh, to the goats and a little bit to the rabbits, and it's cool because they're eating the whole thing, including the root, which is kind of neat. Oh yeah, it, and what people don't realize, okay, if you feed grain to whatever animal, is 25% digestible. Seeds do not want to be digested. They want to be planted. They want to flourish. They want to reproduce. So if you take barley, which has a hydrophilic acid coating, I believe. I might be saying that wrong. Sorry. Uh, but this this acid coating keeps the seed from germinating. So that's why you pre-soak it. Some people will actually add a teaspoon of, of bleach to their water. You can do that. It's chlorine. It will, it will come off. Um, uh, it's a, about a 12 pH. So it's slightly acidic water mixed with slightly caustic will give you a neutral water. Right. Um, I don't recommend using bleach. You can, you can soak for 24 hours and be okay. Uh, or you can soak for 30 minutes with bleach and be okay. So it just it so just that's depends. the difference between using pretty and much. Not. I mean, now, we had talked about one point using rabbit urine. Yes, will that work as well? Well, it's a high pH, and yes, to some extent, it will work. I just don't know at what degree you want to mix them. Gotcha. So the rabbit urine being a high pH mixed with the low pH of the acid around the the shell of the barley will cause it to. Sorry, excuse me. Uh, will cause it to uh, to open up faster. So in an off-grid situation, I'm looking – and this is one of the reasons I'm looking at fodder because even if I'm not going to use the fodder system right now, which I I do plan Uh to, but let's just say I buy it and I put it together 
and I set it there. Yeah. If something happens, I've got 50 pounds of barley. I've got a fodder system. So now in reality, I've got 400, well, 300 pounds mm-hmm. of feed. I've got four goats. I've got chickens. You know, the chickens probably don't want to live just on the, on the fodder, but they'll love it. And I think they can yeah. along with all the bugs they'll get and everything exactly. else. So I can then sit that there if I need it. Start it up. It takes seven days really to start that thing. Pretty much. So uh, it's pretty much a co- an instant. Seven days after something mm-hmm. happens, I've got food for all of my animals. So I need to leave seven days of feed on hand at all times. Yes, I would suggest more than that. And this is why. If you're starting up barley, you don't want to go cold turkey off the pellets and onto barley because you need to give the rabbits – uh, time to develop a different cecum, a different, uh, right. bacteria in their, in their gut. Uh, if you, if you just go straight from pellets to, you're gonna, it's gonna be an abrupt change. You're gonna have watery stool and different things like that. But back to why barley fodder is so good. 25% digestibility as a seed, 80% digestible as a sprout. So in the first day, you've changed it from 25% digestible to 80% digestible. Now, on day two, it's doubled in weight. Day three, it's tripled in weight and so on and so forth until day six. Which is why that 600%. That's where we're getting that is day Mm -hmm. six, day seven. It's that much heavier. Yep. And it's nothing but water. That's right. Because that, then that, but that plant has come out, Mm -hmm. used all the nutrient from the seed that it contained. Exactly. Which now you can digest and get at. Exactly. And so mother nature is amazing. She is awesome. So that's why I went with fodder. And also another thing is if you're buying good, good solid pellets, they go bad within four to six months because there's no preservatives in it. There's nothing in it keeping it uh, from being eaten down by ambient uh, bacteria. Seeds, since they don't want to be digested, can be stored almost indefinitely. Right. As long as there's no moisture in the air and you can get them Keep in an oxygen dry and free, sealed and dark. Dry, sealed and dark, they will not sprout. So, uh, that. What about temperature? Do you know, can I, in Arizona, can I put it in a garage or something with no AC? Is that an issue? The, That's where mine are right now. The, the seeds or yeah, the, the seeds, the barley I, seeds. I think with anything, heat is going to, going to, um, increase metabolite, metabolization. Yeah. Um, I would keep them in the coolest spot possible. Maybe, a impromptu root cellar. Right. Would probably but, be and, really you good. You know, I, we've actually talked about that. One of the things I have, and we get into this prepping thing, uh, right now we're renting, but we're renting a manufactured home on a little over an acre, acre and a half. We may be buying it. We're still not 100% sure. But I'll tell you, I love the manufactured home. It's actually built. The quality of this thing is not what you think of when you think trailer. It is two by six construction. The, the two by six? Two by six. What's the R value on that? I, it's, I can't recall. It was, it's a CAV code and it's fairly new. So I know they build to these really high standards of code for California. So we've been looking at different houses saying, okay, are we going to do a container house? Because we're going to purchase some land mm-hmm. and, and build on it. We want to do this whole non-mortgage thing. So, Very smart. But with this, I can go underneath it. You yeah, know, that's and it's true. not just, I don't need a finished basement type thing. I mean, I can have a root cellar under there fairly easily, a, a crawl space enough to get under there What's and store things like seeds. What's temperature underneath of that? You know, in the summertime, it's cooler. I haven't actually taken readings down there. I'm going to guess when it's 120 out, it's probably 95 down there. Mm-hmm. So it's nice and cool. The wintertime, it's a little warmer. It stays a little moister down there. I've crawled down there other than spiders ever, you know, <laughs> a couple of spiders and we had some baby rabbits down there at one point. <laughs> We've got, you know, it, it, it's an not really accessible and it's not a real friendly place. But as far as storage, heck, I could see using something. I just cut a hole right – and to my landlord, I won't do this. <laughs> I could cut a hole right in the floor and just boom, have a spot, you know, drop you already a – already cut drop a hole a, in the floor. Drop a, uh, you know, some kind of storage tote down there, a 55-gallon drum, and it would sit right on the ground and I could just fill that with anything I wanted and it would be cool. So, you know, there's there's all sorts of ways to do this mm-hmm. thing. Um so that's not a bad idea is putting it somewhere like that. Yeah. In fact, when I tell people uh, the hostile hair uh, slogan is control what you eat from seed to meat and that's what I'm referencing. 
You can store seeds, lots and lots of seeds, for a very long time. You can can the seeds. You know, you don't have to like pressure seal the can or anything like that with the seeds in it. But you can seal them in there and have – you could set up little jars so that you already know what the measurement is. So you don't have to even think about it. You just crack open a jar, pour it in the thing or soak it right there in the jar that it's in and then reuse the jars. You do that all day every day. Yeah, just take a marking on a jar and mm-hmm. dump it in there, soak it, dump it into your fodder system. Yeah, it so, would be really smart. Yeah, fodder is definitely something we're looking into. Uh, we don't spend a ton on food as it is. The rabbits, I've only got a couple of rabbits. Um, I'm getting a new cage system very soon. And Where are you getting that from, Don? <laughs> I know this guy. Uh so I'm not going to tell you because you might get jealous now. Uh, so no, Nick is going to give me a new six t- uh, six compartment system. Right now That's I've got right. three. So we're going to kind of ramp up the rabbit production because Move I've got it some on babies. Up. Yeah. Move it on up. Uh, so, <laughs> so it's it's kind of fun, we're, but the barley I think is going to save us money. I think it's going to save us time, and I think it's healthier. Oh yeah. So and the chickens absolutely love it. The goats right. go insane. They. There's nothing better. They can live on that. Yeah. Now, I you're mean, raising black soldier flies, aren't you? Uh, we are raising black soldier flies as well. So you talk about integration. I mean, this mm-hmm. kind of all goes right into that. Well, what I'm saying is your chickens, they're they're going to take the bulk of their feed in, in barley fodder. Right. And then to up their protein levels, you throw them a few black soldier flies and you well, got it. And see, we don't actually do that. I save my black soldier flies for my fish. Oh. And sometimes for the quail because the quail require a higher protein. Oh, okay. So no, what we are doing is we're taking any of our leftover quails, any of our leftover fish, um, even the bones that we, we've cooked and our leftover table scraps from any kind of dinners. You know, you're, you're munching on chicken and you got that little bit of meat left on there that you can't get off. We throw all that out to the chickens and they're eating that. They absolutely love – like the the leftover meat on these things, and they pick bones absolutely dry. I mean, there is nothing left on these things. Plus, they get to go out and run around and get bugs. So that's true. They're we free throw range. that. They're, ours are free range. Uh, there's a ton of bugs there, so we don't want to put our black soldier flies. Huh. To me, those things are worth their weight in gold, literally. Okay. Um, so I'd rather feed those to my fish. They're exactly what the fish need to survive. They're what the quail need to, to thrive and to give us really good eggs. And then I can take even some quail eggs and chicken eggs and, you know, crunch those up and throw them back to the chickens and, and they're fine. You don't want to get them in the habit of eating their own eggs because then they will eat their own eggs. However, raptors. In, yeah, in an off grid situation, I would have no problem doing that. And we save all of our eggs from our, from our chickens and our quail if we don't hatch them. We save all of those eggs. And we grind all that up and do, we do put that back in the feed for calcium. Oh. So they're, they're getting that. They now, just don't know it's eggs. Right. The only other thing that we would need from outside, the goats need minerals. We have a couple of mineral mm-hmm. blocks and they seem but to those last are, a But those time. are easy to store too. Yeah. Trace minerals. It's, it's yeah. just a block. And, you know, like I said, that'll last two, three months sometimes. Mm-hmm. So we're not too worried about that. And, and the, the milk is phenomenal out of them. And we will give that milk back to the chickens as well. So if we don't use it all, what we eat, whenever you milk a goat, you have to kind of the first couple of squirts out, you get rid of. So we will take that and put that in a, a little glass or something and pour it in for the chickens and they'll, they'll get that. That actually increases their calcium. Why is it that you have to throw away the first couple ounces? My wife could tell you that. I, I don't know. I just Come know on, Don. Do. Uh, it has something to do with Omnipotent the, Don. In there. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. I just know what to do. I was told. Oh, okay. Yeah. He's a good boy. He listens to his wife. That's right. Now, I, I don't know if I, t- I gotta go on this story of my wife was going out of town and so she, needs- I hate milking the goat. Oh gosh. I, I just ate it. So she's going especially, out of town. Especially when Austin turns on the Barry White one. Yeah. Like, yeah oh, I just got this thing. I don't, I don't like doing it. So <laughs> we all have to do things we don't like, but my wife says I'm going out of town 
And we were at a prepper fest and my goat expert, Jill, came by and she says, oh, well, you know, you can make an automatic goat milker. I, I said, oh, my God, I'm going home. I got on the internet that night, ordered everything. I have an automatic goat milker. Do you really? So all I do is I walk out there, I stick these little syringes <laughs> on the goat, I push the button and I get I get the two quarts of milk out of it. So I, I don't mind it anymore. You um, lazy pucks. Yeah, yeah, like- <laughs> milking that goat is, to me, I just do not like doing it. My wife goes out there and she's so fast at it. She can do it. In a quarter of the time, I can. So she's out there for five minutes, and she's gotten good now. She does both teats at the same time. I'm down there, you know, holding the goat, trying to get it in the thing, and hold the. I can't do it, and she's, you know, it takes her five minutes, takes me thirty minutes. The goat minutes. looks back over his shoulder. You're doing it wrong. Yeah, that you're doing gets, it wrong. Well, they get all you're pissed. Doing, off. Hey, hey, not there. <laughs> They get all pissed <laughs> off at you and then they stick their foot in the damn milk. Oh. So I stopped doing that. I bought an automatic milker. It's got a little hose on it. I stick it up. Boom. Oh I got no milk contaminated. It's clean. I can bring it in and my wife is happy. So when she's out of town, I use the automatic milk milker. So That's awesome. Yeah. Now off grid, that's battery powered. So I'm still okay. <laughs> oh, look at you and your that's smartness. Right. Yeah. yeah. A little bit of solar panels and you're, you know, if you've got a directional switch, you can. Yeah. Uh, okay. Goat milker on. Shut off the goat milker. Plug back in. You do in. like a three horsepower and drain that sucker in about three seconds. Right? There you go. <laughs> I don't think cross that goat's eyes. Nice. So, you know, uh, benefits. We're talking. I traded some chickens this weekend. Oh yeah. Um, traded five chickens to somebody for a couple of silver coins. Wow. So managed you know, a couple of ounce the buffalo silver. I like silver. So what was the? I mean, what was the value yeah. of the silver? Well, we did three three ounces for five chickens. I have no idea what chickens are worth, just to be honest with you. Uh, I Isn't think it was silver like thirty bucks an ounce. Uh, Twenty two, I think. 22. At least on the, I think that's what I looked it up. Sixty bucks for three. That's twenty bucks a chicken, then. Uh, no, a little. Uh, it was, yeah, a little more. Oh, it was five chickens. Oh, uh, I'm not going to try and do the math. My head so, hurts. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's. I think it was a good deal. The chickens are, are almost laying age at this point. Oh, okay. So they're pretty good hands. Um, we had somebody pick another two of them up for cash and then we gave a couple of them to somebody else and we traded some meat. Um, so lamb meat, I don't know if you've had lamb meat, but we I've traded, not. we traded some of them for, for some lamb meat as well. So that's the t- type of thing that we're doing. We're living that right now, trying to prepare for off grid. Now, if the time came that the economy completely collapsed, could we survive? Yeah, and that's something we looked at that article on on the five days without power. My wife and I go camping. When we take the three kids and we go camping and we'll do a tent and a, my little five-by-eight trailer, we've got everything we need. We go for two weeks at a time, no problem. But we go grocery shopping before that and we plan out every single meal. I was thinking, you know, if something were to happen right now, I don't know. I mean, I know at home we, we do two meals a day right now off of our property as it is. So how long could you go comfortably? Can you do two weeks? Is that what you're preparing for? Can you well, do two I months have, in an actual off-grid, you know, martial law declared after three days, everything's down, EMP brings everything down or solar flare or something. Let's, let's use that as an example. Well, the, uh, I have food storage of three to six months. So if I had to, I could live off of that. And what about water? Water, uh, I'm actually talking to a guy that, that, that Chris Fry is getting a, a machine that pulls water out of the air. Yeah. I don't know if that's going to work real well out here in the summertime though, is it? Yeah. It's still 12 to 20% I mean, it's moisture. It's a dehumidifier. Content. It's, yeah, yeah. And all, all you have to do is wrap a bag around it and pee in the sand underneath of it. You know, and, that's I know that's kind of gross sounding, but that's how you would well, do you're it. You're not going to have any sewer in that situation, so yeah, it's not like it's not like the pipes are going to go anywhere beneficial to the community, anyways. Right, and that's something being in the city. How do you deal with that? With the waste? Not, yeah. What happens if the sewer backs up? Well, that's when things get gross. I tap into the front yard and put an in-ground composter. I'll put in a septic tank. That's one but thing. But can you do that once it's already there? Once we're at that point and you need it. Do, Can you go ahead you, and do it? Do you not have some 55 gallon drums and a shovel? I don't know. I do, yes. Mine are filled with water, but yes. Well, that's, a, I, I have empty, I, my backyard looks like, 
well, it looks like any redneck's front yard would, but I but have it's all an that. HOA, so it's got to be in the backyard. In the backyard. So I have a few things. First off, the trash isn't going to come and pick up. So I can take those things, cut holes in the bottom. Actually, no, you don't cut holes in the bottom. You let the hole, you plug the holes in the bottom, put a leach field out into the yard and bury it two feet under the dirt yeah. with holes drilled into PVC. I've got PVC. You can look up homemade septic yeah. system and. You just put in a septic system that will handle the amount of volume you're going to put through. How do you dig that deep out here with the caliche and everything that we end up with? I can go down six foot no problem. Can you? Yeah. I know because they've had to build you? the pad up. Yeah. I couldn't see you swinging a shovel. I will hit you. <laughs> Get over here, boy. <laughs> so that's the type my, of thing. I dug my pond. Yeah. I've I've dug down six feet in my backyard. I've had to bury some people. I mean uh, – <laughs> uh, Awkward. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the type we of thing though. We, we need – no, we can't edit that <laughs> okay. one out. So that's the type of thing that, that people need to think about mm-hmm. and that's why I bring it up. What happens when – and it's a great – well, I know I would do this but is it too late at that point? Is it going to – you know, you're, you've been down for a week. When do you do this? When do you implement this stuff? Do you do it now? Do you do it later? Well, you – you can't just go and put a septic tank in your front yard without a permit. Right. And in fact, if you live in an HOA, you're not going to get a permit to put so in a septic tank. Does that scare you living in an HOA in that type of situation? Not really because anybody in a grid down situation is going to still try and enforce HOA rules is going to get the wrong end of the rifle. So I'm not – what are they going to do? Tell me that I've got oil spilled in my driveway when all hell's breaking loose on a government level? Right. Well, and that's something with, you know, I'm a renter right now. Mm -hmm. I plan to be for another few years until we can buy our property and put our house on it. So, you know, my my wife says, oh, well, we don't own our property. I don't think in a grid down situation, my landlord's going to come running, which is out of California. Yeah. Is going to come running and saying, hey, I want the house back because you haven't paid rent. That's kind of what I'm banking on is, okay, if it's bad everywhere, nobody's going to try and enforce petty laws. They're going to try and stop looters. If that – and if they can't stop looters, they're going to try and go home and protect their families. Right, right. So I don't think it's going to matter. If I grab a pickaxe and a shovel and go into my front yard, dig up my sewer line and put in a septic system, there's not going to be an issue. In fact, uh, look up. Anaerobic digestion I'm for methane production. Very familiar with that. That is what I would do. Yeah. Well, and and actually, that's very similar to what aquaponics is. Yeah, except it's aerobic digestion. Right. Right. Yeah. So you're not producing methane; you're CO2, which is then absorbed by the plants. Right. 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 So yeah, there's a lot of uh, a lot of stuff out there. So that's kind of what I wanted to talk about on this episode. I want to get some feedback, guys. So we grow ours. dot com slash ask us. Yeah, give us a scenario and honestly, we're not omnipotent, but uh, we're pretty dang close. What is it? Word of the day is omnipotent. I can't say it. Never mind. <laughs> oh, come on, Don. Come on, say um, it. You say it. Omnipotent. Omnipotent. All right. So <laughs> that means all knowing. Yeah, I know what it means. I just don't know how to say it. There are yeah. certain words that, you know, I know stuff about stuff. I just can't say it. I'm from Jersey, it. okay? Yeah. So, yeah. Do me a favor. Say frustrating. Frustrating. Ah, uh, see, you added the R. You don't usually. Uh, yeah, I mean, frustrating. Not, yeah. You always say frustrating. Not, what I get caught on is daughter. That what? daughter and dog are the two words that people pick up. I don't even know what that first one is. Daughter, your daughter. Oh, daughter. Oh. Yeah, that one. Oh, so you can't yeah. talk. Okay. See, <laughs> so we have a word for that. That's called special. Yeah, here. yeah got, that's called special. I've got Just a speech like therapist. Nick. That's why we get along so well. So watch where you're going there. So uh, to all of our Jersey fans, uh, I love you guys and all my family. <laughs> Jersey is a beautiful, beautiful state. If you've gone there other than Newark and Elizabeth and some of these other places, you get down into the Prin- Princeton and, and down into Flemington and Somerville and Boundbrook and there's Rolling Hills and Pennington. It's absolutely stunning. Um, I grew up out there and I'll tell you, it is still home. It, it is an amazing, beautiful landscaping oh. state. Uh, a lot of people think New York and they think Manhattan, but if you get out no, in the Anirondacks farming. and the Poconos and I mean, e- e- there's, there's some beautiful God's country out there. So. Well, that's uh, upstate New York's all farming, is it not? Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, it's stunning out there. Connecticut is the same way. A lot of New England back east is. You've got those population centers, mm-hmm. but I think if things do happen, people are going to be leaving those areas really soon. And I would never want to be in a city. Oh no. Yeah. This, I mean, 
I believe that an individual is smart, working for himself, trying to solve problems. Individuals are smart. People, as a living, breathing organism of more than one person, tends to be dumb <laughs> because you get the sheep effect where they're just kind of mobbing together. Yeah. Um, so try and make individual choices. Absolutely. Uh, WeGrowRs.com slash ask us. Mm-hmm. Follow us on Twitter. Prepper Broadcasting, we are on Monday nights. I think it's um, 7 o'clock right now, Arizona time. Uh, I think 8 Pacific, something like that. You're, anyway, no, prepperbroadcasting.com. Pacific, Six, because right. the earth is rolling the other direction. Yeah. So, <laughs> guys, go to prepperbroadcasting.com on Mondays. You'll see when our show is. Okay. And there, there's a live chat. I, I try to get on the live chat. That's I'll where try I got to be the on there next out. week. I was trying to avoid the doghouse last night, so I apologize for, for yeah. missing the Monday night live chat. They've been asking us for a live show on that too. So, Glenn, I know you're going to listen to the show since you have to and you're the one putting us on proper <laughs> broadcasting. We'll talk to you about doing a live show to appease our audience. Um, one of these Mondays we'll do a special one just for prepper broadcasting and we'll do a live show. So we'll have to talk to you about setting that up. But Nick and or I will be on live chat most of the time on Mondays. One of us is going to try and make that. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to come there. And it's a lot of fun. I, I had a blast. I learned a lot about people. I learned a lot about what they're doing, some of the questions that, that were there. Uh, some of these guys have their own – we were talking about solar last week. Some of these guys have their own solar setups and they were talking about how they made them or did it themselves. Oh, wow. You know, ingenuity is something. Those are skills that you want to talk about, something that a lot of the kids don't have today is those skills to go out there and, and do this. So – in your neighborhood, go find people who are out there working on their cars and stuff and go stop by and learn because things happen and those are going to be valuable, valuable skills. Agreed. Uh, there's a, uh, oh, what do you call it? There's, there's some danger walking up to a guy that's underneath of his truck though, just an FYI. He might be pretty involved. You might want to give a shout out before your feet are next to his you face. Walk up with a six pack of beer and say, Hey, come over to help you out. You're pretty good. Just make sure he's not LDS because that just go over horribly. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Never even crossed my mind to worry about that. No, they'd be appreciate the offer, but you're probably gonna get an earful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, so should we do the plug of the week? Yeah, you've got a plug of the week, don't plug you? Plug of the week. Yeah. All right, Nick's got one. Uh, this is going out to Rick with Coverall Coating. Now these guys, I. He actually does some metal work and I was playing around with uh, the frame on a shippable cage. I went over there. He gave me some great ideas. He showed me some tactics. He even built a, an assemblable cage system that uh, I could copy and we worked that out and actually bartered. He wanted some ducks and uh, a little bit of cash and ducks. So I don't, I don't, it's not cash and carry. It's cash and Muscovy. Remember, you just promised me one of those male Muscovies. Oh, yeah. It's already been done. Uh, that, I have, I have one in my backyard that you can have. Okay. <laughs> this guy. Anyway, so cover all coatings is the company and the number to reach them. Oh, I'm sorry. They do bed liners and I just bought my new Nissan Titan. The new rabbit truck. That's right. It went from the white rabbit to the brown turd, but <laughs> we'll have to find some other name for it, but this is a big brown burnt red color. Um, uh, but Rick is going to put a bed liner in it. And the price is pretty affordable. So I know the, the, the rhino liners and those types out there, they can be about $500 or so for a truck like mine. And, and Rick came in low, but way below that. So, uh, actually I think it was like 700. What's his number again? It is 480-242-7392. All right. I'll get that in the show, in the show notes. Does yeah. he have a website? Do you know? Gosh, you know, I, I, I'll look it up. If I can yeah, find one, can I'll find go ahead it. and put that I know that he's in. on Facebook too. Okay. I'll so, get a link to him on yeah. Facebook and put that in the show notes. So um, so if you're in the, the Southeast Valley, Phoenix area, you know, anywhere in town really, I mean it's worth the drive out there to get the deal. Yeah. And he does fantastic work. He actually – we played around with spraying some of my pull-out pans for the rabbit cages and they looked really nice. Um if I had a larger order, it would have been a little bit more cost effective on those, but there's just a lot of labor involved. I bet. But with a truck, it's easy. So, so some about the plug of the week. Nick and I do this 
it has nothing. We don't get any reimbursements. We don't get anything out of these plugs of the week other than saying thank you to people that help us out. If Just you guys that have warm fuzzy feeling, yeah. If you guys have a somebody you think is des- deserving the plug of the week, something that they've done, and you send me a story and why. I'm happy to look at that and see if we'll put them in the show and and give you the credit for introducing us to them or bringing them to our attention. So feel free to do that at the website. Just use the same Ask Us link, wegrowers.com slash ask us. Make sure you guys are checking out the blog post and show notes. We timestamp everything in there. Try to split that up into categories. So, oh, speaking of the plug of the week, last week I was talking about vape the e-cigarettes uh-huh. and I use the vapor rage. So I found a couple of local shops with that, but on the chat, it turns out a lot of people out there are getting off cigarettes and doing this. So mm-hmm. I've gotten to meet a lot more people. In fact, on that Monday night chat, we were talking about vaping is the term for it. There's all these weird terms for it. And it's now becoming a really um, more of an expensive hobby. So it's, so the saving money part is gone for me, um, <laughs> but I'm really loving it and I'm still not smoking. Yeah, last week Don had this cute little black something or another. There you go. This week he's got this big silver like 10 inch. It looks like a lightsaber. It's a lightsaber. Before light- you go <laughs> anywhere else with what it looks like, it is a, it looks like a lightsaber from Star Wars. <laughs> from so Star Wars. It's an Keep SVD. Telling yourself that. It's an SVD. <laughs> he's um, got PD. <laughs> Luckily, I do all of the editing on the show. So, yeah. Uh, so if you've got the, the, uh, ask us, I don't know where we're going now. I can't get my mind off of that <laughs> damn e cigarette. Honestly, I will tell you, it's better than smoking. Absolutely. Uh, so if you've got a habit, use it to kick it and play with your lightsaber. <laughs> All right. Before I call Nick names, I think that about does it. Prepperbroadcasting.com, uh, Twitter at we grow ours, we grow ours.com, we grow ours.com slash ask us. I'm not on Google plus, but we'll get there and facebook.com slash we grow ours. If you guys have any other questions, you can email we grow ours at gmail.com is the one we're using. We haven't done the whole domain email thing because I got frustrated with it. So it's we grow ours at gmail.com. Frustrated. <laughs> did I do it? He did it. That's that, I don't. I never even dawned on me before. All right. So anything else that I'm missing, Nick? No. Let me just formally apologize for giving Don such a hard time this this uh, this episode. Uh, I am a bully, and uh, I am a bully because it makes me feel better about myself when I bring down others. So for all you bullies out there, this is not condoning. This is me telling you that you're sad and pathetic. Yeah, and for all those geeks out there, we hold the editing power and I can make, make Nick say anything I want at the end of the day. <laughs> so it, it, we get even. No. All right. Well, thanks for joining the We Grow Our Show. So long. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the disclaimer. That's right, the disclaimer. This American apple pie institution known as parental discretion will cleanse any sense of innuendo or sarcasm from the lyrics that might actually make you think and will also insult your intelligence at the same time. So protect your family. This show contains explicit depictions of things which are real. These real things are commonly known as life. So if it sounds sarcastic, don't take it seriously. If it sounds dangerous, do not try this at home or at all. And if it offends you, just don't listen to it. (laughs) 